Hey guys, Mike here. So today I'm gonna do something a little different and I scoured just countless interviews of Peter Lynch. And if you don't know who that is, he's a legendary investor who worked for Fidelity. He took their Magellan Fund from $18 million to $14 billion in just 13 years. He actually is an active fund manager and he ended up averaging around 30% a year almost. And so that's insane gains, just great performance. You know, he rode the ups and downs and the crashes and everything else like everybody else and came out on top. And so this is a video, uh, it's one of these many videos I've created for my son. I keep in a folder on my laptop for him to watch when he gets older, uh, to understand the market and great investment advice from people who have just killed it, right? Done a great job. And so this is some of the best advice you're gonna hear. And I thought, you know, in this day and age right now in 2022, where we're at in this market, and the road we got ahead, it is just one of those videos, which I mean, I watch it twice a day, just because I like being inspired, I like being reminded of certain things, and some things you actually learn, you know, and so why not? And so, you know, I hope you get something out of it. Hit the like button if you did, but just enjoy it, and let me know what you think in the comments, and how do you like videos like this? The most important organ is the stomach. It's not the brain. There's always... On the way to work, the amount of bad news you can hear is almost infinite now. So the question is, can you take that? I mean, do you really have faith that 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now, common stocks are a place to be? If you believe in that, you should have some money in equity funds. I mean, it's a question, what's your tolerance for pain? So you have to say to yourself, if I'm right, how much am I going to make? If I'm wrong, how much am I going to lose? That's the risk-reward ratio. In stock shop, we talk about, if I'm right, I hope I'm going to double trip my money. If I'm wrong, may I'll lose 30 40%. That's a favor ratio. But you say, if I'm right, the stock's not going to go up. It's already discounting terrific things. If discounting terrific things are already in the stock, I don't want to know. Okay. If it's gone down this much already, it can't go any lower. Uh, I remember when Polaroid went from 140 to about 107, People said, if you ever get Polaroid under 100, you got to buy it. You just back up the truck, buy the stock. Uh, stock, you get to 110, then rally, you know, fall 103, you go 112, go 105. They said, gets under 100, buy Polaroid. Polaroid broke 100, people started buying it, and within nine months, the stock was 18. Uh, I saw the same thing with Avon products. So just saying, you, you know, it's gone down this far, you know, how much lower? I mean, it's crazy, but, you know, it can keep going. In fact, I tried this out. Kaiser Industries, I was a new analyst at Fidelity, and we were about to buy the biggest block ever at Kaiser Industries. The stock had gone from 29 to 17. We we're about to buy the largest block ever in the history of the American Stock Exchange. We bought, I don't know, 10 or 15 million shares. At 15 and three quarters, I said, my God, the stock's gone from 29 to 17. How much lower can it go? So we bought this enormous block at 15 and three quarters. So I called my mother, and I said, Mom, I guess like Kaiser Industries is 10. So about three months later, I said, you ought to buy this. It's gone from 29 to 10. How much lower can it go? Well, it went to 9. It went to 8. It went to 7. It went to 6. It went to 5. It went to 4. Now, fortunately, this happened very rapidly, or I'd be working at the Stop and Shop uh, bag and behind the lines at the Fidelity. So fortunately, this was compressed in only about six months. So I had to go to the fund manager and say, I was a little bit early on this at 15 and 3 quarters. At, uh, <laughs> but it, uh, we call this premature in the business, the... Uh, uh, had a correction, which, you know, is a euphemism for losing a lot of money rapidly at the, uh, uh, so I said, let's check this again. The stock's four. They own 45% of Kaiser Aluminum. They own 59% of Kaiser Steel. They own 38% of Kaiser Cement. They own all of Kaiser Electronics, all of Kaiser Broadcasting, which had seven TV sets. They own Jeep. They had Kaiser Fiberglass. They had about Kaiser Santa Gravel. They had a bunch of other Kaisers. And they had no debt. Now, in this room, because I know Freeman Billings is very interested in financial stocks, no one's ever gone bankrupt without any debt. Now, that would take a real, I think you have to give some kind of distinguished service award to somebody did that. <laughs> but, uh, but they had no debt. I said, it's not going to go to zero. You know, I was wrong when I said it can't go below 15. So we hung on, and within three years, they gave out the shares in Kaiser Steel, gave out the shares in Kaiser Cement, gave out the shares in Kaiser Steel and aluminum, and they sold off all the businesses. You got about $55 a share. But if you didn't know the story, and the stock went from 15 to 11, and you're just saying, how much lower can it go? When it went to nine, went to eight, you'd, you would have gone. So you can't just say you can't go any lower, because I saw Taco Bell go from 14 to one in 1974, and they had no debt and making 60 cents a share. 
you remember when oil went from four to 40? Remember that, remember that period? Oil went from four to 40, and the experts said it was going to go to 100, and all the countries of the world were going to go bankrupt. And then and the big banks going to go bankrupt, and we're going to have a Great Depression, and the stock markets go down, and you're going to wind up selling pencils and apples. You know, the, uh, well, I remember when oil went from four to 40, and the experts said it was going to go to 100. Within two years, oil was at 14. The experts, now much higher paid at this point, are saying it's going to go to four, and we're going to have a depression. And people believe it again, you know. The, uh, I remember when the money supply was growing too fast. They said we're going to have a depression. Then it was growing too slow. We're going to have a depression. And I think it's the older you get, the more nervous you get about these things. I think it's very valuable. I think while younger people are better investors is they're not worried. They haven't heard about all these crises. And they're with children. I think if you don't have any kids, you've got to rent some kids for the weekend. You know, get a seven-year-old and ask him if he knows about the money supply, you know, how fast it's growing. Ask him if he knows about the shape of the yield curve is the wrong shape of the yield curve. Or that we're 48.3 months into the economic recovery and the average recovery is last 52.3 months. You know, ask an eight-year-old if they know about that. Eight-year-olds have a very high expectation about the next 20 years. That's what you need to do. In fact, I knew very well the market was going to go down in October of 1987. Uh, Dave Elson remembers that. It was my first vacation I was going to take in six years. I left on Thursday after the close of trade. The market was down 55 points which wasn't a good start, but it was down 55 points. And we got over there, and because of the time zone, we were able to do what we wanted to do and get down a cork and called in the market was down about 118. And I said to Carolyn, if the market was down on Monday, we better go back. But we're already here, so uh, I'll also stay for the weekend. So as you know, the market went down uh, 508 on Monday, so I flew home because my fund had gone, for, I think, from 13 billion to 9 billion in two working days. And I uh, <laughs> was... Uh, the trend here is not positive. Like, I could do something about it. You know, you know. The, uh, so I have no idea when the market's going to go down and uh, no idea when it's going to go up. I'm totally shocked the market was 4,000 two and a half years ago. Or a little while ago, it's 8,000. Uh, I had no idea about this. Uh, very surprising to me. But I'll guarantee you the market will be a lot higher in 15 years. It'll be a lot higher in 25 years. What it's going to do in the next one or two years, I don't have any idea. And if somebody in this room knows about it, they're not telling anybody. I mean, the stock market's a very good place to be, but I can toss a coin now. Is it going to be lower two years from now? Higher? I don't know. More, more people lost money waiting for corrections and anticipating corrections than the actual corrections. Well, you ought to look in the mirror every day and say, what am I going to do if the market goes down 10%? What do you do if it goes down 20? Am I going to sell? Am I going to get out? If that's your answer, you should be reducing it today. Well, hey, this perfect record. I think the 13 years of Ramagellon, the market went down nine times, 10% or more. I had a perfect record. I went down more than the market. Every time I went down, I went down more. So I, I just didn't worry about it. The point is, would you say to yourself, do I need this money in a year? Do I need this money in two years? Do I need this money in three years? So my Longer term, stock market's been the best place to be. Last 10 years, last 30 years, last 130 years. But if you need the money in one or two years, you shouldn't be buying stocks. You should be in a money market fund. Well, I think my greatest mistakes are, I mean, you know, it's, it's funny on a stock, all you can lose is 100%. I've done that. But your great mistakes is selling a good company and then doubles, then it triples and quadruples because you make a lot of mistakes. And so it's ones that go up tenfold, like on the 10 baggers. So some of my mistakes are just saying, oh my God, this stock is too high. And I was wrong. And you had to figure out what inning am I in this baseball game? I sold Toys R Us way too early. It went up 20 fold after I sold. I did the same thing at Home Depot. Those are probably my two greatest mistakes ever made. When should you sell? Well, you ought to find out why you bought a stock. If you're saying it's a cyclical company and they're doing poorly and they're doing awful, you wait till things are getting better, and they're doing terrific, and then you sell it. But with a growth company, you have to say, Walmart's case, 10 years after they went public, you could have bought the stock and made 500 times your money. You see, still are only in 15% of the United States. And they could say, why can't they go to 17? Why can't they go to 19? Why can't they go to 23? So for the next four decades, they went around the country. So you have to say to yourself, in this stock, I have a 10-year story, a 20-year story. I'll be able to write that down and follow that. That's what I do with the company. And that's your decision. That's how you sell it. At what point do you decide in a company to cut your losses? It's only if the company's doing poorly. If, if you bought a company because you thought this new product was going to work, or the aluminum industry was turning around and you know something about the aluminum industry, if all of a sudden the product isn't working or the industry's getting worse, if you're wrong in the fundamentals, then you sell. If the company's doing fine and the stock goes down, that's a great opportunity. 
look for companies that have something unique. Like example would be Toys R Us when I first found that. You know, they, they only were in they only had seven or eight stores. You said to yourself, they could this concept could have two or three hundred stores. Now by nature, some of those companies might be very boring. Well, yeah, that's terrific. I look for that's great. Companies that are boring are wonderful for me. I've done well at companies like Dunkin' Donuts. Or companies like that, they're very easy to understand. No one's gonna invent a better donut somewhere at MIT. You don't have to worry and about how do you analyze inputs. a Dunkin' Donuts uh, company? Well, well, there's a company that upgraded their stores. It spent a lot of time on on the quality of their product. They really spent a lot of time to have a China cup. Their cup was worth over a dollar. Instead of just having a piece of paper or a plastic cup, they said, we want to deliver something very good to the consumer. They really worked on the quality of their coffee. You know, they, Every 15 minutes, they'd throw it away. and They'd, they'd cook it within three degrees of the right temperature. They really cared about all Did you find that in things. an annual report? No, you had to go visit them and talk to them. But you could find it out. You, you'd say, this is something that really makes sense. And the nice thing about it is, if somebody comes up with a good donut system, and they really have a great concept, it's in the state of Washington, it's not going to affect Dunkin' Donuts if they're located in Virginia, if they're located in Massachusetts.